thanks uh, for coming and uh, thank you, Klaus, for inviting me uh, for this talk. I uh, want today to give you a little bit of a glimpse on what big data and science 2.0 might have in common in the future or already have uh, in the development. And um, so since I'm not coming from a large uh, organization, but from a very tiny one, I want to at least say a few words about it so that you can put me into relation. So on the one hand, I'm a professor at the Technical University in Graz, but on the other hand, I'm heading Austria's Research Center for Data-Driven Business and Big Data Analytics. We are there for more than 15 years now. We have about 70 people uh, working with us. Um, bright young researchers, two of them are also here in the um, room. Um, we are doing a lot of applied research, so that is we are mainly at the moment working with companies, um, <laughs> developing solutions, big data solutions for them specifically, but I don't see really a reason why this wouldn't be also extending for other kinds of organizations uh, which have a lot of data, which I think many of you here have. Uh, in addition, we are running a lot of uh, European uh, funded projects. This gives us the space to also explore a um, little bit more crazy um, ideas and uh, then trying to turn them uh, into useful, usable systems uh, for our uh, partners. Uh, we are lucky that we just got a new funding, uh, so we are funded for the next eight years. Um, we have a, a nice basis now to continue. And our um, goal and our vision is to um, support and uh, develop Austrian com companies into data-driven businesses. And we see this uh, data-driven business as something as a um, compute, uh, uh, cognitive computing challenge. That means that this challenge is not purely um, technical, not purely analytical, but it is also has a very, very strong part uh, on the human side. So in order to bring these technologies into use uh, in different organizations, you really have to understand quite a lot about the cognitive backgrounds of people and how, what, how they can um, take information on, how they can learn, how they can um, actually per perceive large amounts of data and how we can help them to further drill into um, such data. So this is what we are trying to do uh, at the No Center and for this we have uh, four uh, focus points. Uh, on the one hand we are looking into knowledge discovery, so this is really the field where you try to dig deep into the data and you try to analyze the content. On the other hand, um, we are looking into social computing, so these are social networks, and here really the network character, which we've been talking about the last year, uh, the last day, sorry, is, um, is very much in foreground to really understand how people are in contact with each other. Um, another important point is knowledge visualization. How can we visualize all these huge amounts of data which are out there uh, in a way that people can actually do anything with it? And finally, we look into ubiquitous personal computing, which means that we also want to understand a lot about the user, him or herself, by using sensors such as smartphone sensors to understand in which situation is somebody at a certain moment in order to then filter, pre-filter information so that it's um, applicable for his or her task. So it's really context aware uh, and adaptive computing. So big data, what is this really? Uh, there are lots and lots of definitions out there. Um, the most um, known one probably is the three Vs. So it's volume, the, the large, the sheer size of things, velocity, uh, the speed in which this data is coming in, and variety, the lots of different kinds of data which are out there and which need to somehow be integrated and uh, made sense of. However, um, I really uh, like the definition by the Oxford Internet Institute, which does not put all these um, size aspects so much into the forefront, but really looks into what is the difference if we suddenly have um, more data. It's not necessarily, it doesn't have to be terabyte and petabytes, but if we used to maybe take a, a sample only um, once a year um, in some environments, and we suddenly are able to do this every second, um, or maybe only every day, um, then that increases the data itself um, 
but in addition, it really gives us the possibility for much more um, insights to really understand the working of the environment, the working of uh, human body um, in much, much more um, detail. Um, so when you look at the um, analytics part, so really the technical part, um, all of this starts with data. Uh, you can have the um, most different varieties of data out there, text, sensor data, link data, activity traces, whatever, uh, coming in. And um, those might be either openly available in public or they might be private in different um, libraries and different organizations. They might be structured like uh, for, um, taxonomies, ontologies, or they might be unstructured, such as text, which is really hard to understand for the computer. And uh, in addition, and uh, most problematically, they might be very uncertain and they are changing um, all the time. So the challenge is to build such an intelligent algorithms, alg uh, analytics engines, basically, which can take in all these kind of data and um, process them in a way so that people can actually um, understand it better. So, but here actually comes in what uh, I'm very happy that Eric already mentioned this very strongly, this um, human uh, in the loop in all these kind of um, activities. So it's not uh, as many people make you believe the data comes in and magically the big insight comes out. Uh, Instead, there is somebody needed who has a lot of domain knowledge. There is somebody who knows a lot about the publications. There is somebody who knows a lot about um, chemistry or, or mechanical engineering in order to really interpret and understand the data and the analytics um, results which are coming um, out. And this person is really the responsible to bringing in his or her knowledge into um, the analytics to understand, to, to really identify interesting patterns in the data because to find patterns in data this is just uh, not that hard we can find lots of the, um, patterns and um, uh, but may, they might not mean anything so we really need to find the things which are interesting and where where experts say yeah this is an interesting part and so then it goes on, um, and hopefully by the end of this process, we have something which we call actionable knowledge. So something which actually uh, is, is an insight which can be turned into action, which is actually helping some person out there to do his or her work and to solve a problem or a societal challenge. Um, so on the one hand, it can go to users, um, and there, of course, again, we need, again, uh, a lot of visualization, recommendation, um, uh, capabilities in order to really bring across the, um, the, the, the result of the analytics. On the other hand, we can also have um, all these analytics results feeding in back into the computer or back into the data um, storages which we have, but then in a more formal way. So this is also what Eric was talking about when he starts building these foxonomies. So coming out of all this big mess of um, tags, there is a mechanism in creating additional structure on top of this. And this is something which can be fed back into the systems and which can be in future um, analytics then be used in order to gain more insights out of all of this. Okay, so but this was only the technical or um, part of all of this. So um, in order to really bring the power of big data into in where I mostly work businesses is uh, that you have to understand how to uh, uh, build a data-driven business. And there's a, there are nice definitions out there, for example, from LinkedIn. And um, here the point is that you are, have business processes which are based on automatic generation, interpretation, and exploitation of these large amounts of data which are out there. And in order to build such a uh, data-driven business, you have to follow four um, very central steps. On the one hand, we have to provide the data as well as an IT infrastructure to really deal with this. So this is also something which uh, Mr. Bergman yesterday talked about, that this is like a basis which we need in order to really interact with the data and to have the tools to really um, be able to, to, to really look at them and to, to analyze them. But then comes a very difficult point. 
that means to democratize the data within the company. So that means that we have to make this data available to a lot and lots of people and encourage them to really use it and um, uh, have as much openness as possible. And then uh, comes another point, enabling the experimentation with that data. So there comes in, again, a lot of the services or um, expert tools which we can create in order to help people take that data to find the right data which is out there, to link it together, to start um, analyzing on it, and uh, maybe and hopefully having some more insights in it. And then the final point, which is the really part, tough part, is to support a data-driven culture, which means a culture which starts asking intelligent and critical questions, a culture where people say, wait a minute, how was this again? Um, I want to look closer into how many people have um, a certain uh, tumor and uh, I'm pretty sure that there is a um, specific aspect of it. And so you drill into this, you ask more questions and in order to um, answering those questions, you might actually have to create new data. You have to look into your processes to see where that data could come from or if you can acquire it from the outside and then again, the whole thing starts all over again. So you really have to, to, to promote this in, in, inquisitive nature, this, this kind of um, uh, yeah, detective work, which uh, is in science, really, to, to bring it uh, and uh, use the data which is out there in order to answer those questions. So if we now uh, go from data-driven businesses to data-driven science, I think there is not such a large difference. So, of course, we need to not only look at um, business processes, but research practices and processes, and we have to share all that data not within one organization, and that, but uh, across many organizations within the whole scientific uh, communities. And so I want to give you here a few ideas and a few things we're working on in order to make um, this happen, specifically targeting on the last uh, three points uh, on the slide. So um, let me start out with uh, looking at publications as big data. So we had a lot of uh, presentations uh, yesterday which um, showed us how many publications every day, every year are produced. That's not a new phenomenon, actually. This uh, was already noted in 1613 by um, Barnaby. Rich, uh, who noted that it was already becoming impossible to read everything which is coming out there. Um, by now, uh, this definitely is impossible. Even within a limited field, um, there are uh, no possibilities to really read all of the publications which are coming out there. So now when we look um, back at the vision of um, Isaac Newton, who said, okay, let's be uh, standing on the shoulder of giants, of people who have done enormous great work and, and research. We want to reuse the knowledge which has been done, which, uh, which has been created out there. Um, so we, uh, how, how can we do this if we are not even able to read the publications anymore? Um, instead, what's happening, and I think you all can relate to this, is the reality that we are covered under a pile of paper. Um, and so the most important thing, the first thing is to get an orientation to figure out uh, what are we really uh, wanting to look at. So as we had already yesterday, a lot of um, approaches there, um, of course we can start to um, gener generating overviews of um, publication. So this is an example which we did within the um, area of technology enhanced learning research community and there we clustered the publications um, according to themes but in that case it's not themes which come out of the content but it's coming from the usage of the of the um, publications. So if you might know this um, visualization it's also running in Mendeley 
Um, so we are using there how people are actually um, uh, storing or what kind of publications are in their own repositories in Mendeley and then we can see um, which ones are always in the same repositories and we can cluster them according to this usage data and we can through this also see if new um, bubbles, new topics emerge through the usage and compilation of different kind of sets of publications. Of course, another thing which we've also seen yesterday is to really use the click streams. Um, we can have recommendations which then even go across uh, journal publications uh, where we can uh, look at um, clicks where one person so, um, uh, has been clicking through different kinds of um, journals and then uh, if that person goes first in one journal and then in another, um, we can see that there are similarities between the things which he or she is looking at and we can recommend um, additional um, uh, publications. So, but that all still doesn't solve our problem that we might not even have the time to read them all. So, um, we, that's why we started to kind of um, re-engineer <laughs> publications in the sense that we're trying to extract facts, tables, pictures, insights out of papers, out of PDFs, and provide them as linked open data in the linked open data cloud. So basically we're going through a paper such as this, trying to extract the tables, uh, trying to understand as much as possible about the different data which are in there, and also finding um, certain um, paragraphs in the, in the document which seem to be the, the, main, the condensation of the main insight and to provide all of this um, together with metadata um, in the linked open data um, cloud. What then can happen, so basically what we uh, uh, build is a kind of a pipeline. You can put your paper in and uh, you then hit data extractor and it extracts all this. Um, but here again, we need the human again because that's not a, I mean, it's a, it's a nice process. It works to a certain qualitative extent, but of course not 100%. So we need people to look at that to see um, if this is really valid, if this makes sense, if um, the data has been extracted in the right way to give feedback. And finally, then really to publish it in the linked open data cloud um, in order to link it to all the other data which is already um, out there. And finally, uh, of course, we need then tools to reuse this data again and to also reuse other kind of data which is in the linked open data cloud. And I don't know if you ever tried using a Sparkle query on linked open data. Um, even for computer scientists, this is not always straightforward. Um, so you really need a tool which helps you to deal with all this cool data which is out there. Um, so we created a little query wizard which enables um, laymen, lay women, to uh, look into all these data which is out there, to, to look at the different tables, to select the right um, data, and finally to run uh, analytics and have visualizations um, such as timelines and, and, and categorization um, algorithms on top, uh, which makes you, ha helps you to understand the data. Okay, let me summarize this. This is the uh, basically turning publications into scientific big data. Uh, we use, on the one hand, usage data in order to give a better understanding which publications might be important for me. But on the other hand, I, uh, we, I presented things so we really use uh, the text truly encoded knowledge in order to build more uh, formal, more um, uh, linked open data knowledge, which then hopefully in the future will be able to be processed automatically again. Okay, so but then we still have this point about supporting the data-driven culture. And um, there we took, uh, we looked at all these different open data platforms out there and uh, we, we found that they have great data, um, however they are completely unsocial, so it's just data, it's, it's nothing else out there. Um, on the other hand, when we look at the success of the social web, and that's also something which we discussed yesterday quite a lot, um, is uh, it would really make sense to put a social factor somehow with this data together. And so well, we came up with this idea of socializing the resources um, as a success factor. And so it would be necessary to, um, to, to 
enable us to have a discussion around data, to do post questions around data. Um, however, what's very different from the normal social web is that here we are talking about very small groups of people who are really interested in this data. In general, these are small groups of, of researchers uh, who are um, who want to discuss in depth about this so that we need to have specific services and tools for them to, to help to do this. So what we decided upon is to create a um, data flea market. So the idea of the flea market is that uh, there's something, um, there's small things you have. They all of themselves are not that extremely valuable, but they might become valuable by coming together. And you are uh, willing to um, also share them or exchange them with other people. So this is why we call this the, the flea market. And it allows um, people to ask data-centric questions, to put in their data and say, OK, I have a specific question about this, and I um, have a specific idea of how this could be done. But, and then the discussion uh, um, around the data can happen. Um, in addition, we then have um, uh, capabilities and analytics in order to really help answer those questions with, um, with the data which is there, and maybe also um, finding um, other data out there which can help uh, to even shed more light on this. Um, and you have these little buttons with the heart where you can then say, I want to donate this whole insight, this picture including with, a, with the data behind it in order for um, other people to use it uh, in the future. Um, you also, of course, have things like bookmarking your resources and so that you can work on this in the future. Um, we are right now working on an economic sustainability for such a flea market because, of course, uh, this rests a lot on donations and it's a it's a customer to customer situation. This is interesting. It's not a business to customer, so it's really uh, there are two or more um, researchers out there who want to share um, stuff and um, they want to try to, to uh, really um, work together. And so how can we do this? And um, of course, important things are social reputation models, um, which we will be looking into in the future much more in detail. OK, so um, this was a, um, ideas on how we can support data-driven cultures and processes um, in, uh, uh, with, with big data. Um, but let me go one more step once back to the idea of having data-driven science. Um, so I think it's important to also look at the scientific processes which are out there. So there, um, so like as business processes, there are also scientific processes out there. And the most known, of course, is the publication process where we're all very much involved in. But there are lots and lots of other processes. And um, in a while back in an EU project, we did a study um, where we looked into the different processes, core processes of research and also then um, support processes, which what, do, what other things do researchers do in order to get their um, research really going, and management processes, things which help the researcher to really achieve his or her goal, to set strategies, to set goals, and so forth. So I think um, at the moment we are focusing very strongly only on a very small subset of these process steps in order to support them with all the great um, tools which we've seen yesterday here already. Um, but I think it would make really sense to, to look into this. We've tried to basically do a... Um, analysis where there are still open issues, um, where which one of those process steps have been covered really well and which ones have not. And, um, and it would be nice to get also feedback from you in which of those process steps um, different kind of uh, support mechanisms would be helpful um, or not. Okay, and with this I would like uh, to close with a question, um, since inquisitive questions I think are important. Um, for me, the question, is there something like an open science value, a data value chain? So is there something where uh, we come, we start with open knowledge, we start with the researchers doing their stuff, and then um, uh, uh, 
publishing their insights uh, in different venues, open access or with publishers, and then how is this uh, supported by an open infrastructure, open science infrastructure, and how can, in the end, these insights be used for open innovation and um, co maybe even commercialization. So the question for me is really how is there such a data um, value chain and I believe yes there is one and I think we need to encourage um, players out there to take part in this data value chain. So players such as libraries who have a lot of the data, players such as publishers who have the data and also have quite a lot of access to the users and also of course the researchers themselves. Thank you very much. I'm always a little concerned. I have a question. I, um, if, you, if you talk about open science data value chain, one of our mo main problems in, in the area I'm working in education, if you're we're talking about, about research data or other data, is, is not the technical problems, or it's the data privacy problems. So all these things are not happening because we have data privacy problems. The data are in principle open for researchers, uh, but you, you can't work with a different types of data or some, something like this, you are only allowed to use the data sets you are asking for to do your specific research question. you have any experience with... with uh, well, the uh, next speaker, I'm sure, will shed much more light on this. Um, of course, we are, we are looking very much into this on the one hand, also like on, on security issues, so how can you whatever encrypt data if this is really possible, um, but also looking into how can we... Um, uh, ensure the privacy of people, specifically in medical environments where you have like uh, data of patients and, and uh, if you have the, um, the genomical data, this is inherently not anonymizable. You, this is always uh, just one person has that uh, genome. And so, of course, that there are big, big problems out there. And I, I would be very happy if uh, uh, researchers in the domain of law uh, and, and, and policy would uh, yeah, really take this subject very seriously and, and help us go forward because I think this is a big, big um, uh, roadblock at the moment. Okay, thank you. Yes, one question over here. Um, thank you very much, uh, Stephanie, for the talk. Um, um, so all the data you were talking about is uh, like usage data, um, uh, user data. And there's a lot of data contained in the documents. You refer to the code project um, with the fact extraction. Mm -hmm. One problem we currently have, and I think that is a limitation to the uh, open science data value chain, is that normally we do not have the right to, to, to do text and data mining on the documents. We don't have the license, um, even if it's an open access document, you don't necessarily have the license to, to extract mm -hmm. the facts. And if it's uh, licensed um, uh, publications, we as a library only have the license to distribute the entire document, but we don't have a license to do text and data mining. If we can open up that um, uh, limitation, I think then we can uh, exploit the open science data value chain to its full potential. I totally agree. Yeah, there's another question back there. We have two more questions. Yes, one more. Okay, thank, thank you very much for your, for your interesting talk, but um, I, I, I think this is interesting, your idea of a data value chain, but don't you think you have to differentiate between uh, public research, public use, private research, private use, because if you want to blend it in one value chain, it becomes quite complicated, in particular what the previous, what, what Klaus was saying, that uh, indeed we, we, we might be able to, to get TDM, to solve the TDM problem for for the public part of the research cycle, but probably less easy for the private part of it. So where in your picture do you see, because the, it boils down to the question, where do you see uh, the kind of the data commons which is underlying the open science idea and, and the open data idea? So, so at some point in time, we must picture that in as well. Well, I think we have already at least one um, example where this, this sharing of data across different organizations actually works well, and that's the, um, the gen genomic research. Um, so there, uh, there's a, a common standard on how to, um, to, to publish the, um, 
the genome sequences. Uh, there's also, um, uh, the, you have to publish the data when you um, publish a, a publication. And um, so all of that data is really out there and it's available and it's worldwide. It has one format so that people can actually use it. I think that was started because um, there was these incredible amounts of money um, required in order to get to that data in the first place. And in many cases, or all cases, I don't know, this was um, funded by public um, entities. And so there was the handle on it, which really made it possible to, from the start, say, okay, all what comes out there is public. Now with the libraries, you always have the problem that you have also the, the, the history and you cannot ask people um, retrospectively if it would still be okay to extract their, um, their tables out of their, their papers. So this is of course a problem, but this could also be solved in the future by having people really um, signing these agreements that also parts of their, their publications can be used. And I think as long as there's the attribution still to the, to the author, I, I wouldn't really see why, why researchers wouldn't jump to it. One yeah. more question. I just wanted to make a quick point concerning this TDM issues, tax and data mining. I think the, the current agenda is, is essential for us that in particular we support the current revision of the EU legislation in this respect and the tax and data mining extension as suggested by the current report by Julia Reda at the uh, European Parliament. I wanted to mention also that we've got a similar agenda in France. Typically, we're, we're going to, um, to have this Loi du Numérique uh, being discussed this year, where we expect to have two specific articles concerning open access and text and data mining uh, at the French level. And this is a general um, push we need to make towards our politics that they, they, they support such, uh, such changes. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> yeah.